before at seeing um, who's joining and all this other stuff. So I'm going to try to be aware. For example, we had some people joining just now. Question from Surin, can I record this? You can, and for those of you that are interested in seeing some kind of replay, if you go to the Chess Dojo YouTube, there will be a, a version of this thing posted, usually within a day or two of this recording. So it's always, all of the recordings are always available to watch again. And um, I think in general, one thing I want to do, this is just me talking, <laughs> is I would like to make the videos more accessible and interesting for people because they're great content, but a lot of times, you know, they're not as sexy as a lot of the other YouTube videos. So they're not getting the kind of um, viewership that I think they should get. In any case, that's just me rambling on. Today, <clears throat> first of all, I'm going to take a break from the amazing Dojo Rook Endgame progression that I did in the last uh, couple classes. And we'll come back to that maybe in a class or two. I thought it'd be interesting for you and for me to look at a game where I played um, maybe some controversial moves, maybe some genius moves. Good question. I don't know. You can help me decide. Um, and this was played at Denver Open, and this was like round four, I think. That, yeah, this was like my biggest... One of the bigger rivals, I'm playing an FM, uh, an FM who is probably going to be an IM soon. Uh, very talented, determined young man. Austin says, Coach Jesse, I lost a two minors versus rook endgame and also a rook versus two minor endgame both times. Up some pawns. What should I do? Study those games. <laughs> that is truly my advice. <clears throat> you will get better simply by studying those games. Um, that, that is something I know. And also I know that the dynamics of those positions, now they don't come super easily, you know. And we have done several of those in um, the past here at the U.S. Chess School. But not today. Not today. I'm an endgame fiend, <laughs> but this game we're going to look at is not an endgame. All right. So let's start. And my, it goes like this. Excuse me, I didn't do that. I played d5. Now, let me just say something about this. Back in the day, uh, it was considered absolutely incorrect to block your c pawn from the central fight. And uh, actually, what this position reminds me of is um, yeah, there's in Nimzovich's chess praxis, there's a position that I believe goes like this. Knight f3, knight f, how does this go here? Yeah, d5, d3, knight c6, d4. <laughs> and he gives d4 an exclam. And he says, Black, you are a fool. <laughs> you are a fool for having allowed this position where your knight is blocking the c pawn from participating in the center of fight. Now, from the vantage point of history, it's obviously a humorous anecdote where it's also instructive because clearly back then they valued these placement issues far more in a far more like dogmatic way than they should time because that is what black got here in this position. In any case, we have the reversed position here and it's white to move and it's definitely fully playable for white. This is sometimes known as the Yobava London. Okay, so here we go, Bishop F4, and I just want to admit, I know nothing special, nothing special about this opening, the Obama London. Is that what I said? The Yobava London. But the Obama London, that might be an opening too. I don't know. So, <laughs> uh, this is fine. Uh, it doesn't break, hasn't broken any principles. But again... 
The reason I told the kind of joke, if it were, about the Knight C3 and the Nimzovich thing is that the question now is, what about the C pawn? What about the central fight? Okay, now one thing I want to say, I don't know if I did any... We'll debate the quality of the moves that I made later. But something that I did in this game that I'm very happy about, and I talked about it in another uh, lecture, about, and that lecture was called something like intuitive versus calculation moves, is that I knew in this position that I had several good moves and that I should just play my intuition and that I should not spend a lot of time on the clock. So these first couple moves I played basically instantly. And you know, what I mean by that is there's all kinds of things. I'm sure bishop f5 is playable. E6, C5, G6 is probably playable. A6 is weird, but that's probably playable too, right? So all this stuff is playable, and as long as I make principled moves, it's going to be okay. And of course, I want those moves to kind of match my chess intuition. Again, I know no theory or anything like that in this position. I'm just following principles. And my chess intuition was that I should play E6, followed by bishop d6, simply with the thought that um, when I play bishop d6, it creates a, a situation that if he takes on d6, queen d6 will win a tempo for me, and cd is also interesting. Okay, so let's see what happens. e3, bishop d6, and now my opponent gets frisky with queen f3. Played instantly. And I'm, I'm on top of it today where I'm going to admit people who come late. These terrible, terrible people who come late. <laughs> Thank you, Madison. All right. So let's think about this position. Um, and, well, actually, let's open the floor. Let's open the floor. What I would like to hear is just a strategical assessment of the dynamics of what people feel the dynamics of this position are going forward. Does anybody have any thoughts? Just, it doesn't have to be that deep, but just like try to imagine what White's conception is and what some of the things we might be uh, looking for in this position. Now, Vihan is giving me a question mark, and maybe that just means, hey, buddy, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean, you know, about what in general we're looking for? Yeah. We got a comment, white might cast so long since they played out the queen early. Um, <laughs> and I would love for somebody just to come out and we can chat a little bit. And if you have any idea what you think the dynamics are. Austin says, now generally there was an old school rule when we did this that someone had to put an exclam if I was going to call on them. But I know Austin well. Me and Austin go way back. Let's see what he says. I think black's already screwed up because the bishop is locked in, which means there is no favorable Carlsbad transposition. I had a similar position versus NMU, and it was very unpleasant after he went for knight f3, e5, and f4. Tori says knight b5, maybe. Now, let's say that it is absolutely true that this bishop is controversial, that I need to do something with him later, and that perhaps we could argue that instead of e6 on move 3, I should have played bishop f5. But the general intuition that white black's having here is that bishop d6 creates an immediate question to the bishop. Yeah. And I think you're absolutely right that if knight f3, e5, like if he could have done that instead of playing queen f3, well then maybe that's something I would have to worry about. I guess I'm interested in anything else, and just in terms of dynamics, the people. 
people notice about what's going to happen here. Austin says knight f3 was interesting. Perhaps, yeah. Perhaps. And honestly, when I played bishop d6, to my mind, I was just playing good principled moves. But I had a sense of what was going to happen here. Uh, right at this moment. Uh, in terms of dynamics. Any thoughts about what's happening? Okay. So, uh, the thing that I would like people to see is that pretty well certain now we are getting opposite sides castling. And all of a sudden, the position is going to get really, really hot. And it, it's helpful to notice it now <laughs> that you're going to say to yourself, you know what, this position is going to get hot. Um, white's going to castle long. And then, actually, let's do this. What was white's intention after I did this? By the way, I think castling long here might be a thought, but that's not what he did. He had a different intention. What was it? G4. That's right, Austin. Here he comes. Boom. Oh, buddy. Here we go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, looking a little bit like uh, Ferruja today against Nepo. Take it easy, Ferruja. Take it easy, buddy. You know, just <laughs> relax a little. <laughs> a fire is about to start. That's right. Now, one thing that I, I admire about this kind of play is if you get good at it, if you get good at it, then you are truly a dangerous person. And that would require, I think, a couple things. Having a feel for the initiative, and uh, then you're going to want to do some be able to do some really good calculation. And, um, yeah. Now, in this position, well, I felt, uh, obviously, the hair on, on the back, on my back is raised a little bit, you know, a little hot here. And, yeah, okay. So what should I do? What should I do here? Leon says c5 center cause flank. And I think I would translate that as action on the wing is met by action in the center. And the only question I have about c5 is if we do it, what do we do after g5? It's kind of, it's kind of actually a serious question, isn't it? Austin says 94 sack the point. Maybe. But I what do I got? Bishop D7. Okay. I like the way you think here. Um though I gotta say, I don't know. I don't know. Like snip, snop, snook. Sloop, and then let's just say I'm greedy and take this guy. I'm up a pawn. Queen a5 check, exclam. Why, why is that an exclam? I just go away. <laughs> exclam. <laughs> Queen a5 exclam. Yeah, but look. Look, I, I'm up a pawn. And you have to worry about some F3 stuff. Okay, but let's say that's a thought. And one of the things I like about it is it is true that since we are playing... Uh, let's start back here. Since it's a blood hunt now, 
with opposite sides castling, that we should be encouraged, I think, to um, uh, attack and, and give away material. And this is one of the key points I want to notice. note. When the initiative is always important, but when you have opposite sides castling, the value of initiative goes up. Let me try to explain. So, the initiative is always important, and probably in the back of your mind, you are comfortable with like giving up a certain amount of material for the initiative. And all it means when we say the value of the initiative goes up is you should be more willing to give away material to get an initiative, right? And right, h6 would help uh, white in this position. Of course, today, Nepo played h6 <laughs> against g4, so h6 is not always a terrible response, but here, it definitely didn't cross my mic. Not only because it might be a weakness, <coughs> but it's also a loss of time, and h4, g5 would really help the rook get in on h1, and that would be the worst case scenario for me. In general, we should say the obvious. The king's side is going to be his side of the board, and my side of the board should be the queen side. Um, and so, in general, I don't want to make pawn moves on my weak side of the board. Okay, so what should I do? Okay, that's plausible. We got a suggestion of snip, snop, and then c5. I think this is plausible. Um, Okay, and if I take, how does this go? My question, I guess, is mostly when this goes down, I'm worried about my knight not having a great square. That's what I'm most concerned about. This might be playable, but again, I'm just worried about my knight not having a great square. Bishop f4, ef4, and yeah, totally plausible. Now the issue with ef4, of course, is that now c5, I, I will kind of take over the center, but this is also playable, yeah. Okay, now again, one of the things I wanna stress is there are intuitive moves and there are moves that involve calculation. You do not want to spend a lot of time on the intuitive moves because you will need well, simply a much more time for when it's time to calculate. So there's a variety of plans here. I think c5 is interesting. Obviously you take on f4 first. Um, personally, I am a development fiend and I played knight c6. And obviously I would love to play e5. He played g5, he still hasn't thought at all. I went back. Bishop takes, pawn takes. And now this is the first position I would like to spend a little time on. And what I'm gonna do, Greg Shahada, that jerk. <laughs> Greg Shahada, that jerk. Years ago, I was like, Greg, give me, the, give me the right to do a poll. Give me the right to do a poll. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't let me have a poll. No way, he never let me have a poll. So um, what we're gonna do though, is I'm gonna give two, uh, two moves 
four white. And um, I want you to do your best guesstimate about what you should do. Okay, so here they are. Queen g3, hitting the pawn, defending this guy. Also maybe clearing the way for knight f3. Or castles, abandoning the g-pawn. Okay, so there it is. There's your, there's your question. Two moves, castles or uh, queen g3. And um, I'm going to give a moment. Let's give a couple minutes. Let's give them a couple minutes, yeah. One of the things I will tell you when you're thinking about this is three minutes is a good time because it's, in many ways, I think one move I like better than the other, but it's still, in many ways, a intuitive decision. That, you right. <laughs> I think it's still an intuitive decision about which way to go, queen g3 or castles. And I uh, got some answers, and that's fine, but I would encourage you to use the entire time. Change, feel free to, you can write, but feel free also to change your mind. I do want to give the full three minutes. I might, I might chat your ear off while I'm doing it, right? <laughs> but, uh, and I have to admit all these people, and from the waiting room. But I do want to you to think about it. And then we'll probably bring some people in who can voice their opinion on what they think should be played. Um, MB says, I don't know, who's MB? Madison. Yeah, Madison, you, you, can, be, you can be first up, but let's give it another moment. Try to uh, collect your thoughts, too, as to which move you like and why. Greg Shahada might be lurking. And if he is, Greg, where is my pole? <laughs> you villain. <laughs> oh, I love, I, now normally I don't, I don't quote what, what, what people are thinking, but this is too good. This is too good. Austin writes, I prefer queen g3. It may not be absurd for black to destroy the impertinent g5 hoplite to regain the f6 location for the steed following a rapid queenside castle with neglect to the vanguard soldier. <laughs> I like that one a lot, Austin. Oh, Austin's been, been reading. He's been reading books, man. Okay, Madison, let me find you, and then we're going to invite you on. Let's see here. All right, so ask to unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, so I liked Queen G3 best because mm -hmm. um, I don't really don't want to give up that attack on um, the king side mm -hmm. with the pawn on G5. And also I like the attack on G6 or D6. And I can always queen side castle later. Okay. Because black would have to take care of the D6 pawn first. Okay, well, well reasoned, well reasoned. Um, we got, in fact, say um, most people liked Queen G3. Did anybody, 
Uh, first of all, yeah, does anyone want, else want to come on? And especially if anybody liked castles, if, they, if that was their intuition. <laughs> yeah, give, give USCS coaches pull power. That's right. All right, Austin, come on in. Yeah, in a lot of these positions, I feel like um, White might actually be better off with the king in the center because uh, he already opened the C file with bishop d6. So if black sticks a rook on c8 and then moves the knight and then sacks on c3, like the king on c1 isn't looking too safe. So perhaps White could just leave the king on e1. And then if black decides to attack the b4 pawn or something, he just plays rook d1. Okay, so you were saying, what, 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 what are you saying White should do? Uh, I was saying queen g3, but I'm just giving some reasons as to wh why White may not choose to commit to castling on the queen side. Okay. Fair enough. Uh -huh. All right, anybody, did anybody say castles? And why? Interesting decision. All right, so I want to say this. In the game, white played queen g3. Now, by the way, I have not reviewed this game with the computer, and I haven't shown it to my famous coach. <laughs> I haven't shown it to the coach yet, so I'm still working on it myself. So I have some open questions. And one other, this is in many ways entirely selfish that I'm showing you this game because I'm hoping you guys can help me figure it out because we are going to be involved in some chess mysteries. This game isn't that long, but there are some deep mysteries in it. Violence, you know, violent games, they sometimes don't last that long, but there's often a lot going on uh, in them. Okay. How about this? Can someone express what, before, before you do any variations, right, what is controversial about Queen G3? What is controversial about that move? I think there's two things that are controversial. Controversial just means drawbacks. It doesn't mean it's necessarily the worst move in the world, uh, but it just means a drawback. Austin says you move the queen twice, right? You could say another one is don't move a developed piece twice. Good, so that's number one. And what's number two? That's number two. Though that, I think, is the primary one. There's another little secret here. Another little secret. Now, beyond saying maybe e5, and we can look at the variations later, but I just want, in a principled way, what's controversial about queen g3. Okay, so the other thing that's really important to see is, let me first address the, the, the first one with the, the, the question of development. So, um, of course, this is a very hard position to judge, and it's not like I immediately thought the queen g3 was a mistake. Maybe it isn't even a mistake, but I just want to tell you why it felt controversial to me. I knew that we were going to get opposite sides castling, and I knew that time was more important than it normally is, right? So the value of time has gone up. And so queen g3 is therefore a little bit controversial. Okay. Uh, because it's giving me time. The second thing, okay, is a little bit more hidden. And that is that if we imagine that the king is going long. Frankly, I think it has to go long. I, it's hard to, it's gonna, if it doesn't go long, it's also gonna be in trouble in the middle. Plus, you wanna go long because there's gonna be reasons to have your rook on d1. When you go long, you will, I think, want your queen to be close to her man. Your queen is your best defender. So when you play queen g3, it's like, God, oh, you, you know, the lady's leave, leaving her man. Not a good look, you know, not a good look. 
So that was why queen g3 felt controversial to me. And I do not know in an objective way if queen g3 is better than castles. But I do feel strongly that on a practical level, castles is correct. Because if I take on g5, I am losing the initiative and I'm just opening up the g file. I'm not sure I should, in other words, be taking on g5. Um, maybe I can. And if I did, I guess I would plan to like plant my lady close to my man over here. Totally a thought. But notice that because we are going to have attacks on opposite wings, that um, the G file is thank you very much. So I don't know exactly how this could go, but I'm assuming something like this. And I, I'm not sure yet if I can play knight f4, but that would be the first question. I would have to analyze this, this, and this. Does it work out? I don't know. But <laughs> this is something that the guy would have to figure out. It's very frightening, honestly. It's, it, yeah, it's already, and it, I don't know. It's already really scarier than I care to deal with. This the, the the level of fear factor, fear factor, fear factor is too high. Okay, now again, though, from White's perspective, he doesn't have to play knight f4 here. He could also back it up and play queen g2 and then rook g1 next, and he will have the jump. Okay, he will have the jump on the king side. So the interesting question for Black would be. Would I take that pawn? And the answer is, I don't know. I don't know. It's unclear to me if I want to take that pawn. Okay, but that wasn't the problem I had to face because my opponent played queen g3. <coughs> okay, so there are a couple plans here for black. And um, I would like to ask, what plans are there? Austin's gone full poetic here, talking about <laughs> how the queen's filing for divorce and all kinds of stuff. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. Okay. All right. What are some thoughts here for Black? Angela mentions B5. And I got to admit, I didn't even think about b5. However, uh, even if it's not possible due to like either queen d6 or knight b5 or bishop b5, uh, it should be said about that move, that violent, violent move, that it is at least in the spirit of the position that I want to develop my, I want to blow it up over there before he has a chance. And maybe one thing we should say about b5 is it's a, a drawback is not just that I lose a pawn, but that when the lady takes on d6, she has a lot of control and influence then on the queen side of the board where it seems like a big party is about to start. All right, Madison's talking about f6. Any other thoughts? and had some interesting thoughts, but I don't hear quite yet a plan. Angela's saying knight b6, c4. Good. And let's say with the move knight b6 that in addition to just the blunt c4, we might play knight a5 and then one of the knights to c4. 
and then maybe queen b6, and then maybe bishop d7, maybe rook c8. It looks actually very promising. Yeah, okay, good. So, so far we've heard uh, knight b6 and f6 and b5 is interesting. Anything else? Anything else that's mildly plausible? Now the thing is with people are talking about knight b6 and then e5 is, let's look, let's say knight b6 castles. E5. This is totally plausible, by the way. But I'm worried about the center pawns. And so here there's ED, and then bishop g2, and also some kind of more direct stuff. In the game, I was worried about things like this. Now, this honestly maybe is still super complicated. Like maybe I got that move but also maybe I don't, you know, maybe I also don't, oh no, I don't know what's happening, please help me. You know, I don't know, I don't know. Um, and of course he doesn't have to do, well, he doesn't have to do that, he can do other things too. Okay, and then this kind of gets to the heart of the matter because black has loads of moves. Black has loads of moves. Okay. And Austin says knight c3 in that final variation looks like it wins. I believe that's true. Vihan says e5 instead of knight b6. Throw away calculation, charge into battle. <laughs> but then I think he's saying no. He might be saying no. Madison says f6. f6 is definitely a thought. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with this decision, something I'd like to stress is that what you can see is, and maybe this is really, this points to some of the danger with queen g3, that black has at least a couple plausible plans that look hella dangerous, like very dangerous. And we're gonna see that I, Perhaps, we're gonna see, we're gonna see. You guys can evaluate what I did as however you like it. But um, we are going to see that maybe what I did was too risky. Maybe it was absolutely correct. I will tell you why I did it on principle. And the thing I was trying to express here is Whatever you choose, you should not spend more than, probably more than, definitely not more than 10 minutes, even though it's like a clearly fateful decision in your chess life here, <laughs> right? About which plan you choose. You don't want to spend 10 minutes because you know, you know it's going to get crazy later. For sure. You do not have to be a genius to know that you're going to have some of the hardest calculation uh, setups that you're going to have to deal with ever coming up here soon because it's opposite sides castling. And let me just say one thing about opposite sides castling. Not only will the initiative count for more, but like it will turn into a really devious calculation battle where everything will be decided on just a detail. I can tell you that from experience. Okay. So... Uh, one thing that will be interesting when I talk to the coach is he doesn't like it when I take risks that seem to him 
unnecessary. So I think, I don't know, this seems like I just have good play, you know, this kind of thing. And uh, that's maybe what he's going to tell me. Okay, all right. So <laughs> what I did, though, is to me, my intuition had everything to do with the principles at stake. So I felt that the initiative was now more important than material and that the queen had committed a, uh, you know, a, a misstep. She's away from her man. So here we go. I played e5. And where it's a truly weird move, you see, is after he castles, what do I do? <laughs> Wait, who says this? <laughs> Madison's like, spit it out, I want to know, just say the move. <laughs> okay, what do I do here? Now, beyond saying knight b6, plausible, and notice that that would then transpose to the variation I think you suggested earlier with knight b6 and e5. What is the drawback, though, of that variation on a positional level? Okay, let's ask. What is the drawback on a positional level about knight b6? Uh oh, Madison's saying I take too long to say the answer. E5 is weak, what else? <laughs> I'm tormenting poor Madison here. I'm tormenting her. E5 weak, D5. No, that's not it, Vion. What's the drawback of knight B6? No, leaving king side, D6, B pawn block. No, that isn't it. That isn't it. Interesting, no one gets it. Okay, the drawback, this is, this is just standard attacking chess here, okay? The drawback of knight b6 is that you are getting in the way of the lady. Where does the lady want to be? She wants to be in an attacking position, okay? That's where she wants. So knight b6, the problem is she's in the way of the lady. So, well, what did I do? Queen a5. Well, this is clearly controversial. Let's look at what happened. Takes. Knight b6. Takes. What did I do? Bishop f5. Now, clearly, <laughs> clearly this is madness. However, I want to stress, before we uh, talk too much smack about how I'm a madman or whatever we want to say I am, that the good thing about what I did is I did not take forever about it. Now, clearly it was a big decision, so now on the clock I have spent uh, 18 minutes to get here, which given the weight of the position is not that much. Uh, so... I.e., if I'm going to do this, I can't spend forever getting here. Because I will tell you this, there is no way, <laughs> there's no way to evaluate this in terms of calculation yet. So what am I saying? The guy can play knight f3, knight e2, bishop h3. He might be able to play some moves I'm not even aware of, Right? And all I need is to make sure there's no immediate tactical blow which consolidates his position. What is my notion? I'm going to play rook c8. I'm going to play knight b4. And it's lights out. That's the intention. And also, important to see that when you think about the initiative and the opposite side's castling, right? The initiative, more important than material, you need to um, think about force count. So again, the lady is far away from her man, and I've got 9, 12, 15, starting to, starting to add up, 18, and then we're about to get this dog over here for 23. That's a lot of juice. That's what's a lot of juice, my friend. That's a lot of juice. And what has he got? Uh, really, maybe one. One guy. One guy and a couple helpers. You know? That's about all he's got. 
doesn't look good. The other thing maybe to notice too is that the issue is this guy kind of needs to stay in communicado with this square because you got to worry about that stuff once the bishop moves, right? That's kind of the issue. And Vihan says D7. D7 is 200 IQ. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Austin says, what if white plays d7 to stop rook a c8 and distract the bishop from f5 away? So here's an interesting thing. One thing I could feel in my opponent's body language is that at this point, he did not believe me. He, he confidently played knight f3, which maybe is the best move. And I said rook a c8. And then he tanked. And he was like, oh no. <laughs> then he was like, oh no. Maybe I am in big trouble. Now I'm going to spend some significant time on my own thinking about um, all the different variations and the objective evaluation for white. But I do think, as I think Vahan said, that d7 might be 200 IQ. However, Let's look at it for a second, and I took it, and then ask ourselves, just intuitively, just intuitively, what is the assessment of this position? Who is better and why? Actually, so let's do this. Let's do another poll. Who is better and why? Just this, just intu intuitively. And I'm going to say it's, I'm going to say for myself, it's not a, it's not necessarily a slam dunk. It's not necessarily a slam dunk. So let's give this a couple minutes here. We'll go three minutes. And we're going to say just three options. And I want everybody to answer. You do not have to explain yourself, but we'll, we'll give a couple of people uh, time to explain themselves. And this is just, but I want everybody, at least in the chat, to give an answer. You just either say white, equal, or black. And then tell me if you would like to come on after and uh, give your thoughts. Yeah, if you want to just tell me your thoughts, that's fine. You don't have to be called on. You know, you could tell me I want to talk or something like that. Let's give three minutes here. It's a really interesting question. Yeah. I'm, there's some real interesting questions about how I'm going to ask some strong players what they feel about the way I played it. Like, am I taking a necessary risk? That, those kinds of questions, you know? It's kind of definitely controversial, you know? Controversial the way I played it. Vihan has a very confusing answer to me. Lots of people are saying uh, black. Okay. Oh, here's Austin. Austin's really been reading like Jane Austen. <laughs> Objectively, I get the sense that white should be better, but I don't envy his obligations. <laughs> I love this. I love Austin, man. Me and Austin are, are buds here. I love this guy. So, um... <laughs> Yeah. 
This is about one more minute, and then I'd love to have someone come on, because I think there's some interesting things to say out loud about the dynamics in the position. Well, if you have a theory, come on and tell us. Come on and tell us. All right, who's ready? Who's ready to come on and tell me their theory about the position? What is happening here? All right, Tori, let's hear it. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. Okay. Um, I think that pack is better here because despite at the beginning like having the pack, I don't think it would be fast enough with H4 and H5 uh -huh. for it to start being a threat to uh -huh. Um, black right and black's pieces are already on the queen, queen side ready to attack with the two knights bishop and the rook on the c file so i think here black is slightly more active with its pieces and it's just maybe not like decisively winning but i think they're at least slightly better okay fair enough anybody else would like to come on All right, Madison, let's hear it. To be honest, I don't really know who's winning. I feel like white has a lot of attack and so does black, but I chose black because of um, the two knights and the bishop that look really interesting. And also the queen on a5 that is more active than white's queen. Uh -huh. And yeah, that's really it. Okay, fair enough, yeah. Now, one thing that I guess I was fishing for, right? I was fishing for an, a certain intuition is that the reason to believe in black. Now, I'm, again, I'm not entirely sold like black is crushing or anything. It will ultimately come down to concrete variations. But the reason to believe in black is that the initiative is more important than pawns when you have opposite sides castling. I can't stress it enough. So here it is clear that white isn't going to mate me anymore, and therefore my king is much safer than his king. Right? Um, I did have to do some variations here, like um, I needed to mm, make, make sure that knight, like knight d2 didn't work, and I had to make sure queen f4 maybe wasn't so good, queen d6 wasn't so good. But in general, I was very happy. And the other thing to really say about this position, right, is yes, it's probably 200 IQ to play d7. However, the, uh, the oxygen in the room, or let's say my fear factor, I, I'm able to rest a little bit far more assured after d7 because, you know, I'm not worried. Let's, let's say that this is his extra pawn. He's got two extra pawns, right? Which one am I worried about? I'm worried about this dog over here on d6. I'm not worried about the pawn on e3. <clears throat> the pawn on d6 might really give me a heartburn at some level, right? So it's probably correct to do d7, but you can just, I can tell you, I was just so relieved because now I knew that the only problem I had was just this extra pawn. And the extra pawn's a bit of a chump in positions with opposite sides castling. Okay, now one of the things, again, I really want to stress is I knew, I didn't know what the guy was going to do, okay? I didn't know what the guy was going to do, but I knew that things were going to get really hectic very soon. And he played the provocative A3. So again... In this position, you have no idea what your opponent's going to do. You know, you just need to make sure that you calculate, like, the moves which might end your attack. Like, knight d2, b3, if he could achieve it, I think that would really hurt me. <clears throat> right? So I think my variation was something like knight b4, so I'm threatening knight a2. And on king b1, I have knight a4. 
and then I keep my attack. So my opponent played a3. And now I knew that it was time to think. And so here I thought for 12 minutes, and then the next move after that, I thought for 26 minutes. The second move where I think 26 minutes, I think I was fairly certain I was winning, so I felt a little bit more comfortable in really taking the time to make sure I had everything kind of dialed out. Okay, so uh, we're running a little bit out of time and let me just show you what I did. This next move, I actually think so far, <laughs> I'm gonna look deeper at it, but so far, uh, my gut is that it's a mistake. I played knight b4. No, it's not my gut, excuse me. <laughs> the calculation. There was a key move that I missed in this knight b4 variation. The issue, the reason there is um, a need to do something faster rather than later is because white has the intention of knight d2 to b3, after which his king can be a little safer. I am going to spend some time in this position myself, uh, looking at maybe alternate ways of doing things. And as an admonition to myself, Austin will appreciate that big word, <laughs> as an admonition to myself, mm, I think I might have gotten carried away with an idea here and um, maybe didn't calculate it. Well, obviously, there were some things I missed. So let me just show you what happened. I played knight before. What's the point? Well, I need to open the rook. I need my pieces to kill the king before reinforcements can arrive, right? So uh, AB is the critical variation. But since we're running a little low on time, I'm just going to show what happened. One of the interesting things about attacking chess is it, it, it's always hectic. It is always incredibly violent. And there will be mistakes by both sides. Um, night before, by the way, it's like the move Black definitely wants to make work in the sense that you know, force count. I just need to open the rook and I need to kill them. And I need want to really want to kill the knight because the knight on c3 is really his only defender. And one of the interesting things about this position is I only calculated a, b. And if we had more time, I could spend probably 40 minutes on a, b. That's how complicated it was. And I did miss something. Um, but my opponent didn't do that. He played rook d4. And here's where I tanked forever. And I just wanted to make sure because I had so many moves here. I had knight c2, uh, I had rook c3, and then after rook c3, uh, I, I needed to figure everything out. I'll just show you what I did and then we'll end it for today. Rook c3, pop. I think this is the, this is the easiest. And what I had to make sure one of the things that was hard, actually, is there are so many other variations that look tasty. But eventually, I, made sh I just made sure that in this position, there was no way for the queen to hold on to the rook. And so uh, in the game, this happened. And I was very confident at this point, even though material is... Um, what, is, what do we got here? It's, <laughs> what do we got? Is it even now? It's even. Even the material's even. I was confident I was winning here because, again, the force count and the initiative. Better king. So it went uh, queen c3, king c1, knight c5, and maybe black has something, white has something better, but he played knight d2, and after rook a4, we can resign. Is this correct? No, but not, 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 not rook a4, you... You fool. <laughs> Bishop A4. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay. Rook A4 lost and left. So that's right. Madison, thank you for being here. And um, this was the end of this game. I, I don't get a chance. I'm usually such a lame-o. I don't get a chance to play exciting chess, so this was kind of fun. It points to several interesting things about chess intuition and then something that Faruja needs to come to the U.S. Chess School to learn. Obviously, I'm being a little bit ironic, but it's not that wrong. <laughs> what I'm saying is the kid, the kid is tanking, tanking in intuitive positions. And then, you know, clearly, let's say in this position with, uh, with A3, well, now it's time to work, and I'm going to need the time on the clock, you know, to really do some deep calculation here. And even, even, even though I did a lot of it, I think I got something, something's wrong. By Faruja, that's right. Okay, my friend, oh, poor Faruja. Poor Faruja, now, you know. And if, <laughs> if you want one more lesson to take home with you, before we end here, don't play a bunch of bullet games before you're round the next day. Just don't do it, not advisable. Not something you just, uh, just wanna do, okay? All right, everybody, I'm going to end it there. It's always a pleasure. I think next time we will come back and we'll do some uh, Rook Endgame progression as we did in the last time. So we'll do a continuation of that one. All right, everybody, take it easy. Have fun. And how do I get out of here? I got to go boop. And I got to end. Goodbye, everybody. Greg was lurking the entire time. That's true. All right, Chess Dojo. Oh, I did that with a few technical hiccups, right? <laughs> oh, man. All right. You guys, I don't know if I'm coming back tomorrow, by the way, with, uh, with the stream. It's just so, with, with the candidate stream, just so upsetting. So upsetting. But Eugene did, have, we did have a schedule for G Eugene, so I'm going to talk to him. If he wants to do it, I'll do it. All right, everybody. Bye-bye.